He gave up a promising sporting career to serve in the defence of king and country in the time of war, and flew in defence of the British Isles before this Nieman pilot returned home to take the fight to the Japanese before falling foul of a training exercise. Welcome to I Was Only Doing My Job, an Australian military history podcast. This is the life, service and legacy of squadron leader Keith William Bluey Truscott, who served as a fighter pilot in the Second World War as part of 452 Squadron in the defence of the United Kingdom and 76 Squadron in the Battle of Millen Bay. Keith William Truscott was born on the 17th of May 1916 in Praran, a suburb of Stunnington along the banks of the Yarra River in Victoria. He was the second child to William Edward Truscott, a wicker worker, and Maud Mabel. Keith was educated in the Melbourne High School, where he was both an academically well-performing student and a talented athlete, where he captained the first 11 in cricket and the first 17 in Australian rules football. While there, he was also prefect and house captain. After leaving school, he practiced as a student teacher at the Spensley Street State School in Clifton Hill, Victoria from 1935 to 1936, before going on to work as a clerk with the W. Anglis & Co. Proprietary Limited, a meat producing and export company in Footscray. Thanks to his athleticism, he was physically imposing, was standing at 5 foot 9 and at 12 stone 13 pounds or 82 kilos, with a mop of wavy reddish hair that gained him the nickname Bluey, which stuck with him for the rest of his life. From 1937 to 1940, Bluey Truscott played with the Melbourne Football Club in the VFL or Victorian Football League, a provincial precursor to the National Australian Football League. For the 44 games that he played for the Melbourne Demons, he played as half-forward flanker, which I have to admit, I have no idea what that means. In his time with the Demons, he kicked a total of 31 goals and played in both the 1939 and 1940 Premiership victories and was considered to be one of the team's best players. In his inaugural year, he also made the jump to theatrics, where he performed as the character of Constable O'Brien as part of the 1937 Princess Theatre production of Someone at the Door, a comedy thriller about an ambitious young journalist who comes up with an outlandish scheme to get his first big story. He plans to hide his fiancée in his ancestral home, fake her death, and then get himself arrested for her murder, wherein his fiancée would suddenly reappear at his trial, proving his innocence and leaving the journalist with the ability to supply his own paper with the exclusive story. However, the couple uncovers a real mystery when they become mixed up with jewel thieves whose loot is hidden in their house. And judging from the reviews at the time, this production was well received, with Truscott receiving a number of excellent reviews. At the age of 24, with five games remaining of the 1940 VFL season, with Melbourne tabbed as to be the favourite to win, Bluey decided to enlist in the Royal Australian Air Force on the 21st of July, 1940. This was after he shared a beer with Stan Bissett, a national representative rugby union player, who had participated in the ill-fated 1939 Wallaby Tour of Great Britain. Bissett later recalled that he and Truscott were thinking deeply about the war and that people were giving up everything to participate. They had an intense patriotic feeling towards Britain and decided that it was up to them to not wait for the enemy to come, but rather to fight where they had the better chance of winning, and that's what they did. This decision attracted a lot of publicity and controversy and was used by the relatively young Royal Australian Air Force the same way that Elvis Presley was used in later conflicts. Surprisingly, despite his physical capabilities on the sporting pitches in Melbourne, he struggled with flying lessons, especially in the cockpit of the notoriously temperamental de Havilland Tiger Moth biplane trainer. He would repeatedly level out six metres too high on landings and crashed frequently. This potentially could have been washed him out and suspended him from pilot training had he not had his sportsman's fame. Because of this, he was given additional time, which was usually denied to others, and he eventually began to demonstrate the qualities of coordination, anticipation, judgment and determination in the cockpit that he showed on the pitch. As Melbourne made it to the grand final in 1940, Bluey was granted leave by the RAF, a rare move in a time of war, to play in the winning side where he scored one goal. Once the game was over, he returned to his initial training course, where he was considered an average pilot, albeit one that was very passionate. This grading would stick with him for the rest of his life, where he was never considered a great technical flyer, but he was considered very aggressive and accurate with his gunnery. In the 31st of October 1940, he departed Sydney, arriving in Canada on the 20th of November, and was assigned to the Royal Canadian Air Force to continue his training as part of the Empire Air Training Scheme. The Empire Air Training Scheme, also known as EATS, was a policy designed to train 
Commonwealth and Empire pilots and air crews for eventual transfer into the Royal Air Force during the Second World War. This policy in Australia was envisioned after the British Empire was unable to supply enough pilots and aircraft for the Royal Air Force for the defence of the British Isles. In Australia, the scheme would eventually also branch out to provide the training of pilots for deployment in the Pacific. It would seem that in Canada, a lot of the issues that plagued him in his initial training period seem to have been mostly dealt with as he earned his pilot's wings in February 1941, graduating 8th out of class of 52 and passing with distinction. His specialisation was in fighter aircraft and he was sent to England to join the RAF squadrons being raised there. He was assigned number 452 squadron on the 5th of May flying Supermarine Spitfires. 452 Squadron was the first RAF squadron to be raised solely in the UK and would become part of 11 fighter groups stationed at RAF Station Curtin in Lindsay under the command of RG Dutton, DFC and Bar. The squadron was comprised mostly of newly arrived Australian pilots flying a variety of Spitfire variants, including a handful of experienced airmen from the Commonwealth. Bluey would quickly position himself as an integral member of the squadron, forming a friendship with Irish-born fighter ace Wind Commander Paddy Finucan, and they would form an effective pair, which resulted in Bluey scoring his first confirmed kill on the 12th of August 1941 after shooting down an ME-109E. Bluey and Paddy fostered a sense of camaraderie over beers and banter at watering holes across the London area. As the rowdiest member of this motley crew of pilots, Bluey would be found usually plotting his next prank. Naturally, he found Paddy's custom-painted Spitfire, covered in shamrocks, irresistible, and temporarily added kangaroos to the legendary aircraft. In 1941, after destroying several Messerschmitts, Truscott Spitfire had its tail shot off and fuel tanks ruptured. Returning to base, the Spitfire eventually ran out of fuel over the English Channel. Bluey attempted to bail out at 4,000 feet, but was caught up in his cockpit. He broke free only 400 feet above the sea, with his chute opening moments before he hit the water. For fighter command following the Battle of Britain the previous year, which resulted in a British victory, the decision had been made to conduct raids and attacks on occupied Europe with the intent of luring out and destroying the Luftwaffe in attacks of the Allies' choosing. These raids were codenamed Circus and would include small groups of medium bombers, usually no more than 30, who would cross the English Channel and attack Luftwaffe and industrial targets to intentionally force the German Air Force into the air, where they'd be immediately set upon by up to 16 squadrons of fighters. In these intense operations, Bluey's kill count would gradually increase, and after three months of flying, he had destroyed at least 11 German aircraft. He would be promoted to acting flight lieutenant in September, and was awarded his first distinguished flying cross for downing six aircraft in a single sortie. He would receive his DFC personally by King George VI. These actions quickly resulted in Bluey becoming a fighter ace, in a squadron that was quickly becoming the highest scoring in fighter command. This elevation of status put Bluey in the same standing as Clive Killer Caldwell as one of the most famous RAF pilots. This status and his celebrity from sport made Bluey a rather effective tool in fundraising for the RAF, to the point where the Marquess of Donegal, a title of peerage in Irish nobility, exalted his red-headed countryman to raise £5,000 to purchase Bluey his own personal Spitfire, which was named Gingerbread. In January 1942, following the reassignment of Paddy to commander of 602 Squadron, Bluey rose to replace him as acting squadron leader, which was made substantive in October. He then became the commanding officer of 452 Squadron. By this time, he had shot down 16 aircraft, possibly destroyed three more, and damaged two additional aircraft. The following month, Bluey spearheaded an attack on a Kriegsmarine fleet attempting to flee through the English Channel. Although the Germans were ultimately successful in their infamous Channel Dash, he received credit for damaging the German destroyer Z7 Hermann Schumann. These acts resulted in him receiving a bar to his DFC, making him the best known pilot in the RAF. Bluey's highly competitive nature didn't always sit well amongst his fellow pilots. After destroying two BF 109s during a sortie over northern France, he shot at German parachutists who had managed to bail out and justified the action having recently witnessed an enemy pilot firing on a parachuting RAF pilot. Bluey's close friend and crew member, Clive Barty One, DFC, later confronted him. You're a bastard, shooting at that jerry in the parachute, One said. Bluey merely shrugged, flatly replying, he might have gone up tomorrow and shot you down. One of Truscott's more unusual sorties was Operation Leg, which involved his squadron escorting a Bristol Blemmon to parachute a prosthetic leg into St. Omer Hospital, where the captured Douglas Bader had been held by the Germans. 
Bader was already a famous pilot who'd lost both his legs in 1931 after crashing his plane in an air show. However, as a fighter ace with 22 confirmed aerial victories, he was well, he was well regarded by the Germans, who, with the consent of Hermann Goering, the commander of the Luftwaffe, agreed to Bader's request to allow the English to parachute in a replacement leg. The Japanese bombing of Darwin in February 1942 necessitated the recall of experienced Australian pilots to form the nucleus of new squadrons in Australia, and the Pacific Theatre was where he would join 76 Squadron, swapping his Spitfire for a P-40 Kitty Hawk. This caused some initial issues as standing orders at the time were that all pilots returning from campaigns abroad must relinquish their ranks. However, political interference saw Bluey retain his rank and pay upon his posting to number 76 Squadron. This placed him in what his commanding officer wrote as an invidious position, as the two held the same rank. Returning to Australia on leave in May 1942, Bluey turned out one last time for the Melbourne Football Club. He was unfit and out of touch and struggled to keep up with the play, but he was appointed captain and given a hero's reception by thousands of supporters. Several days later, he encountered his former teacher, Bill Woodfull, who asked him how, had he enjoyed his return to football. Not for me, too dangerous, he replied, which considering the previous year he had, including being shot down, says something about AFL. 7-6 Squadron would be assigned to Gurney Field in Papua in July 1942 alongside 7-5 Squadron and would fly with Squadron Leader Peter Turnbull, whose life, service and death is covered in episode 12 of season 1. These squadrons would arrive weeks before a Japanese force landed at Milan Bay, but not before Turnbull was assigned to replace squadron leader Peter Jeffrey, who was appointed to establish and command number no. 2's operational training unit in April, who was the previous commander of 7-6 Squadron. The Kitty Hawk fighter bombers of number no. 75 and 7-6 Squadrons played a decisive role in driving back the Japanese land force. For the first time in World War II, a Japanese land offensive had been defeated. Now, as I mentioned in my conversation with Preston and Sayer from War Stories, there is some debate surrounding if Milan Bay was the first actual land defeat of the Japanese, but that was how it was promoted at the time in media, so that's how I'm going to address it now. Sadly, as mentioned in his own episode, on the 27th of August, uh, Peter Turnbull was shot down during the Battle of Milan Bay, resulting in Bluey taking command. For several days, while the outcome hung in the balance, he led from the front as the Kitty Hawk pilots strafed and bombed enemy land and sea forces and repelled occasional air attacks. During the battle, 7-5 and 7-6 squadrons fired 196,000 rounds and wore out more than 300 gun barrels against ground targets, raking the palm trees at low level for snipers. With Japanese marines less than 5 kilometers from the airstrip, Bluey's pilots were ordered to evacuate to Port Moresby to protect their assets. However, Bluey refused his orders, mindful of how his ground crew would feel being left behind after all the officers had evacuated. Conditions were appalling, with near-constant rain, mist and low cloud, and a perilously slippery air strip, and often intensive anti-aircraft fire. Bluey was mentioned in dispatches in 1943, which read, I commend No. 76 Squadron for its excellent work in the Milne Bay operations. The 110 sorties carried out by your squadron in a period of eight days were carried out under very difficult conditions. Even though you were forced to operate from unfinished landing strips and during adverse weather conditions, the organization successfully carried out these fighter attacks on enemy forces. I am cognizant of the fact that these operations were completed in the face of the enemy who had penetrated as far as one of your landing strips and within short distance of the other. The courage and determination displayed by members of your squadron contributed materially to the defeat and the eventual withdrawal of Japanese forces from this area. 16 October 1942. Gen George Kenny, Major General, Commander. An official report notes that Bluey was literally adored by the pilots and ground crew. His devil may care swagger, fiery red mop of hair on which a Melbourne Cricket Club cap was usually perched, an infectious smile just couldn't fail to inspire confidence in others. Number 76 Squadron was later transferred to Darwin, Northern Territory, and the RAF Journal Wings stated that when outclimbed by Japanese Zeros in early night dogfights, Bluey would turn on the navigation lights of his Kitty Hawk to attract Japanese fire giving him a chance to shoot back. One night in January 1943, Bluey intercepted three bombers head-on over Darwin and with just one gun operating effectively, shot down a Betty Mitsubishi GM-4, bringing his total count to 17. Aside from this, most of the work of 7-6 Squadron at the time was relatively routine and often tedious garrison duties, flying patrols in northwestern Australia. 
Keith William Bluey Truscott was killed on the 28th of March 1943 following a RAF training exercise with the US Navy off Exmouth, Western Australia. It had early been agreed that the RAF would launch surprise faint attacks on any US Catalina flying boats when they came across along the coast. At Bluey's request, the US agreed to keep their Catalinas well off the water during these exercises. Two days later, Bluey and his wingman, pilot officer Ian London, sighted a PBY Catalina flying boat number 101P1 from Fleet Air Wing 10 in the distance. The conditions of the day were unusual. The water ha- had a mural-like effect to it, creating a false horizon. The Australian Echelon had prepared a beam attack at what Luden thought was a height of well over 200 feet, or 60 meters. Due to the weather conditions and the distance from the Catalina, Luden and Tri- Bluey were unable to discern that the Catalina was actually in a slow descent preparing to land in the water. With the sun shining in their eyes, it wasn't until they were 730 meters before their contact, where Luden realized their true altitude. He radioed Bluey, but it was too late. Bluey Truscott's P-40E Kitty Hawk clipped the water at a flat angle. He immediately pulled up the aircraft, but it stalled 60 meters in the air and fell into the sea, killing Bluey instantly. He was buried with Anglican rites and full Air Force honors at the Caracatta Cemetery, Perth. He was 26. Bluey's life and service was honored in several ways. The RAF later named a base on the northern coast of the Kimberley region, Truscott Airfield. Bluey's Spitfire Mark V P7973RH is now on permanent display at the Australian War Memorial, where it currently sits atop a pedestal in a commanding position in the Second World War Gallery. If you ever get a chance, go and see it. The Melbourne Football Club's award for the best and fairest player is named in his honour the Bluey Truscott Memorial Trophy, and at Melbourne High School, a scholarship is awarded in his name for a student displaying all-round achievement in academic, sporting, and extracurricular activities. During the Battle of Australia Commemorative Committee speech in 2008, then-Prime Minister Kevin Rudd invoked his story, and he's also the bearer of several streets named crafty him across the country, usually around Air Force bases. Renowned aviation writer Stanley Brogdon said this about Bluey Truscott. For more than any other single man, Truscott has been accepted by the public as the prototype of the Australian flying men. Probably no other strain was so dear to the public as Bluey Truscott. He was more than a hero. Bluey was one of the mob. Every man in Australia felt that Bluey was part of him, but much bigger. He was idolised and idealised, but not put on a pedestal. By all accounts, his Spitfire gingerbread was a notoriously unlucky aircraft, with six pilots being injured after Bluey returned to Australia. But its enduring connection to this demon fighter pilot cannot be understated. And for that, Bluey Truscott, we thank you and we honour your service. Thanks for listening to the I Was Only Doing My Job podcast, a Doc Network production. This episode was written, produced, and audio engineered by me, Ross Manuel, with additional research done by Laurie Favell. I'd really appreciate it and it would help out the show if you took some time to share this with a friend or leave a review on Spotify or Google Podcasts or iTunes or anywhere that you listen to podcasts as it really helps other people find the show. If you want to know more about today's episode with photos, show notes and transcripts, head to www.thedocnetwork.net and follow the show on IWODMJ on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. Don't worry, there's a link in the show notes. If you want to follow me for history-related hijinks and other nerdery, you can follow me on a practically everything at Doc Winters. Once again, thanks for listening and catch you next time. Bye.